Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, and welcome to uh, the third Homegrown Innovation Challenge webinar of our series of four. Um, uh, my name is Jeff Cool. I'm the uh, head of strategic initiatives and projects here at the Homegrown Innovation Challenge, and just delighted uh, to have an opportunity to speak with you and uh, share some of the details about um, this exciting initiative run by the Weston Family Foundation called the Homegrown Innovation Challenge. I'd like to kick off the event shortly by providing a brief overview of the initiative uh, as well as um, a few, maybe even a few tips as we uh, lead up to the December 20th deadline for Shepherd applications. Uh, but just before I do that, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Lucas Alexandrovich, who is our program manager uh, for the Homegrown Innovation Challenge. And just would like to say a few words uh, about housekeeping. Lucas, uh, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Jeff. Sorry, I just had a little bit of delay here. Yeah, welcome to everyone. Very excited to be hosting this. And I just wanted to uh, share a couple words about the agenda and how we will be running things today. So overall, the agenda is structured into three parts. Uh, in the first part, we will conduct a webinar and a Q&A session, a question and answer session, where we'll uh, provide details on the Homegrown Innovation Challenge, um, you know, different aspects on the funding structure, the type, the type of solutions we're looking to fund, uh, our review process, and hopefully give you all the information that you need to uh, submit an application into the Shepherd phase in December. And after this, we'll have a short 15 minute opportunity for you to ask any questions uh, that we can answer uh, via this channel here. Uh, and to do that, you can post your questions in the chat uh, on the right hand side and you can start doing that at, at any time, really. The second part of the agenda will be a structured networking session. Uh, so as you would have seen when we first started the meeting, you found yourselves probably at a table with a number of other people. And what we'll be doing for the networking is that we're going to be randomly shuffling uh, participants across tables. So we'll have six of these random shuffles throughout the event. And each of the shuffles, each of the sessions will be 15 minutes in length. And so during each of these sessions, we hope that everyone around the table can introduce themselves, talk a little bit about uh, their work and why they're interested in the Homegrown Innovation Challenge. And we're hoping that this would enable you um, really to, to network, to find others, uh, find other ideas or participants that you could link up uh, and include in your application uh, to our funding program. And I'll talk a little bit more about the structure of this uh, after our presentation. Uh, and then, then finally, thirdly, the very last session of the day will be uh, an open networking session. So for example, if you found someone today that you've quickly connected with during the networking that you wanted to spend a bit more time with and you know talk with them at, at further length about an idea, this is where you can find a spot at a table and you'd have 40 minutes uh, to, to, to talk with others that you want to connect with. During this last time as well, uh, the staff from the Weston Family Foundation will be at a table. The, there's, a, there's a couple of tables uh, labeled with a foundation name, and you can meet us there to ask any other questions that, that you might have. Uh, next slide, please, Jeff, thanks. So overall, um, you may be new to the Remo platform. Uh, it's definitely a first for us at the foundation, but we, we hope you're gonna find it a fun and interactive way to connect with a lot of people uh, today virtually. Uh, and just quickly to help you get oriented in Remo, I just wanted to outline a few of the main tools and, and functions of the platform. So I think similar to most uh, online virtual platforms, Zoom, Teams, et cetera, at the bottom, you'll find all the functions to, uh, you know, uh, start sharing your screen, your camera, your microphone. There's an, uh, a chat function where you can chat with other participants and you can also list or view the participants list. Uh, in terms of chatting, there's three ways to uh, communicate with, with people at the event today. There's a direct message chat where you can uh, communicate with an individual, just a one-on-one. -on -one. 
There's a table chat where you can communicate with the table that you were at. And there's an open event chat where you're communicating with everyone in the event today. Um, if you need any tech support, then look for uh, Glacier Farm Media, uh, who's our support partner in the uh, participants list. And you can send them a message if you have any questions. So when you're at a table as well, you can switch between tile view, which will enlarge and just focus on the cameras of the people at the table. Uh, or you can switch back to floor view where you see the whole sort of conference area and all the tables around. And you can also zoom in and out of that screen as well. So you could focus in on a table to see who's there. Or you can zoom out uh, just to see an overview of all the tables in the event today. Uh, you might have noticed you have the ability to move yourself between tables. If you double click on another table, you can move yourself there. Um, in the first two sessions of the agenda today, you really don't have to do any of that. Uh, it's really all structured and we'll be presenting the webinar, so there's no need to move yourself around. But that function is there if you need it for the very last session, if you'd like to meet someone at a table and talk with them uh, a bit more directly. Uh, and otherwise, please keep your cameras and microphones on today just for a better networking experience so we can hear and, and uh, see each other uh, and use a headset if possible. That's it for me, and I'll uh, uh, hand it back over to uh, to Jeff. Thank you so much, Lucas. Um, so at this point, I'll dive into the webinar um, section of the agenda, and I will try to keep it brief uh, and allow some time uh, for question and answer uh, at the end of this session, as Lucas noted. Um, of course, again, as Lucas mentioned, please go ahead and add any questions you may have into that Q&A dialog um, uh, at any time. Uh, and you will also see that you can vote those up. So we'll certainly try to um, observe any prioritization that is established through your voting. Also, just want to let you know before we uh, jump into uh, the presentation that uh, we do have a website if you haven't seen it already. It's www.homegrownchallenge.ca for the English language website. I think you, you can find quite a lot of information on that website and indeed we, we do strive to keep it current. Um, you can also reach the team here uh, in Toronto at challenge at westernfoundation.ca or defi at westernfoundation.ca. Um, so please don't hesitate um, to reach out to us. Um, we are here to help. So I'd like to um, really start by going directly to what we call the challenge statement, which is really the objective we are hoping that at least one team will achieve by the end of this challenge around 2028. And that is, and it reads as follows, the Homegrown Innovation Challenge asks innovators to create and deliver a market-ready system to reliably, sustainably, and competitively produce berries out of season and at scale in Canada. This is found on the landing page of our website. And I don't think it's an overstatement to say this is the most important sentence that you can find uh, on the website and in all of our guides. Uh, this is really what we're trying to achieve uh, in this challenge. And with few restrictions, we don't really care how you achieve it as long as you achieve it. So please pay very close attention to this one sentence. I've actually, in some of the conversations I've had with uh, a few folks, including some that are on uh, the call today, and, I, and may I say it's so nice to see so many familiar faces, um, I almost recommend that you print this out and as you're writing your application, you keep it on your screen so it's top of mind at all times because this is ultimately how we will uh, assess those applications that come in. As I think many of you know, this is a, really a three phase uh, challenge. Um, so we have the spark phase, the shepherd phase, and the scaling phase. The deadline for the spark phase, of course, was in May. And just uh, a couple weeks ago, we announced uh, the first 15 grantees in the Homegrown Innovation Challenge, each of whom received a spark award in the amount of $50,000. Um, so of course, that phase has gone by. Um, and of course, the purpose of Spark funding is really to support uh, conceptualization and ideation and team building, and ultimately the assembly of an application uh, for the Shepherd phase. Um, 
Now that shepherd phase, which is coming up very rapidly, the deadline is December 20th, 2022. And that is a really important deadline because that's when the door of the homegrown innovation challenge closes. You need to be into the, uh, to the initiative for the shepherd phase. Indeed, you need to receive shepherd phase funding in the amount of up to $1 million in order to progress to the scaling phase and excuse me, to qualify uh, for the awards, the $2 million awards at the end of the initiative. So very important date, December 20th. Shepherd phase, for those of you who don't know, is meant to support small scale proof of concept uh, for solutions that address that challenge statement. And we'll be selecting in March um, 10 teams uh, who will each receive up to a million dollars uh, to support that proof of concept work. Moving to the scaling phase, we anticipate a deadline in, in late 2024. And uh, of course, we will only allow Shepherd grantees uh, to apply to that scaling phase. Um, and so what we're hoping to do at that point is take the top four of the 10 Shepherd grantees and select them for scaling funding. And of course, the scaling funding is very significant indeed, $5 million per team. So $20 million total earmarked for the scaling phase. Uh, and that $5 million for a team is really meant to support the scaling up, the, the readying of your solution for, for full commercial implementation. Um, so to be sure, we don't require that you actually launch your technology implemented in the marketplace uh, before the end of the challenge. But I think our expectation is, is that by the end of the initiative in around 2028, we do expect that you'll have a system that will be ready for full implementation and ultimately contributing to a, a more independent Canada uh, as far as fresh produce uh, goes. Um, if you haven't looked at our website recently, um, uh, you should know that we have recently posted um, a, a sample application that outlines all the information that you're going to need to provide as part of your shepherd phase application. So you can go onto the website now, you can download that PDF, which is, uh, which I think is has a lot of useful information. For those of you that applied at the Spark phase, I think you'll find that this application is quite similar to the Spark uh, application. One of the key differences is, however, that we require the submission of both a technical plan and a implementation plan. So technical plan really gives us um, a sense and overview of how you uh, will go about um, uh, creating and validating your solution that addresses the challenge statement. And of course, the implementation plan talks more about how you will ultimately achieve a foothold in the marketplace such that you can deliver berries and other uh, great uh, fruits and vegetables uh, to Canadian that are growing right here at home. Um, so take a look if you haven't done so already for that PDF uh, on the website. Now, um, that PDF is not actually meant to support your application. It's just really to provide information. Like we did in the Spark phase, uh, all submissions in English to the Shepherd phase need to go through our online portal managed by Smart Simple. And we're just in the final stages of, uh, of, of preparing that Smart Simple portal. Uh, so we're, we're intending to open that up on September 30th, so very soon in about a week. And then that will be live and you'll be able to go in there and start your application and uploading information. For French language applications, uh, we've made the decision, as we did in Spark, not to create an online portal system. Instead, any French language applications can be prepared um, just using a simple Word document, as long as you adhere to the word limits that are set out in that application form. And then by uh, that deadline on December 20th, uh, we would ask you to submit uh, that completed application to, to us via email at DeFi at Weston Foundation, Foundation points say up. Uh, also on our website, you'll see profiles of our international judges and I've uh, reproduced them here on this slide. Um, 
we've, we're very pleased uh, with this judging panel. Uh, we had a, a fantastic experience with them uh, in June during the adjudication for our Spark Phase projects, and they'll be back in March uh, to handle the adjudication for Shepherd Phase. Uh, really, they bring a wealth of experience ranging from plant genetics to greenhouse physics, uh, indeed to business. Um, and I'm not going to go uh, into their into each of their backgrounds, but suffice it to say um, that they not only uh, are have been engaged by the Weston Family Foundation to perform that review and assessment of your applications, but they're also available to speak with you in advance of submitting an application. So I would encourage you to go onto our website, check out their profiles, and if you think there is a judge that might, might provide some useful information to you, or maybe there's one that you think you'd like to bounce an idea off of, you're fully entitled to do that. And we have explicitly told the judges that any interactions with uh, prospective applicants won't create any kind of conflict when it comes to the adjudication itself. Um, so we'd encourage you to do that. And likewise, you're also, of course, welcome to connect uh, with staff uh, here at Weston Family Foundation. Indeed, many of you have, and I think Lucas and I have both very much enjoyed uh, meeting with uh, with uh, folks really from coast to coast over the summer. That's been a real pleasure and a real highlight of the summer for both Lucas and me. The only other point I'll make on this slide is that what's a little bit different for the Shepherd phase compared to what we did at the Spark phase is that we will be employing um, independent reviewers that are engaged by the foundation based on their subject matter expertise. Um, so we once we see what the applications look like, we'll be recruiting those reviewers. And so they will be conducting a review uh, and then feeding their reviews into the judges who will also be uh, charged with reviewing specific applications. And all of that will culminate in our adjudication session, which will be held uh, in early March and has already been scheduled at this point. We've had a lot of questions about intellectual property rights um, very recently, in fact. And I thought I would just go through this in particular. And the other point I will go through on the next slide is around eligibility and, in fact, uh, the role of the qualified donee. Um, the first point I'll make right from the get-go is that the, the Weston Family Foundation, as with all of our programs, does not take any interest in any intellectual property that is created through the participation of any entity in the Homegrown Innovation Challenge. Um, moreover, we don't seek to influence who holds those intellectual property rights. We really leave that to the discretion of the qualified donee and any co-applicants and collaborators. That said, we do expect the qualified donee who would be the lead applicant and that entity entitled to receive funding directly from the foundation, uh, we do expect that qualified donee to make inventive contributions to the intellectual property uh, and otherwise make a material contribution uh, to the Shepherd Phase project and of course beyond if you advance. Um, the one provision we do have around commercial rights uh, that we put in the grant agreements, and indeed we did this with our Spark uh, grantees, is that we do require that the food product that is that is derived from any technology that's created in the Homegrown Innovation Challenge needs to be made available to Canadians promptly uh, and as a priority. Um, the Weston Family Foundation is exclusively focused on the well-being of Canadians, so naturally uh, that is important to us that uh, Canada be, Canadians be uh, a, a benefit from any technology promptly. Now to be sure, I'll repeat, that's not saying that the technology necessarily even needs to stay in Canada or that it can't be licensed or otherwise transferred to a foreign entity. What we're referring to is the food product, the berries. We want those to be made available to uh, Canadians at a reasonable price, uh, price competitive, um, as promptly as possible. Very important to us. Having said that, and just to re-emphasize a point I just made, again, we don't 
we don't seek to influence where intellectual property goes. So if you are a qualified donee or if you are another Canadian participant and you wish to have a foreign producer, for example, as part of your team and they would like to have some rights or all of the rights to the intellectual property, that's at your discretion, subject, of course, to the third bullet point. I know this is a little bit uh, complicated in a way and a little bit nuanced, so if you do have uh, any questions or if anything wasn't clear, again, pop that right into the, uh, the Q&A dialogue and we can go into more detail or cover this again as necessary. I mentioned that I also want to say a few words about qualified donees and their importance to this project. As a, as a charitable foundation in Canada, we can only provide grants to qualified donees uh, as per uh, federal government legislation. And qualified donees are defined uh, by the Canada Revenue Agency as academic institutions, registered charities, municipalities, other types of governmental entities, uh, and there are others as well. Um, so the, when we write a check, uh, when as part of our granting process, it has to go to a qualified donees. We do say explicitly though, uh, in our terms and conditions and indeed in the grant agreement, uh, that qualified donees may procure goods and services from for-profit entities at fair market rates. So if you do have collaborators, for example, that are for-profit entities, you're absolutely entitled to take some of our funding and procure those goods and services uh, as necessary for you to um, achieve our challenge statement. Okay. Indeed, we very much encourage uh, the formation of multidisciplinary innovation teams. Uh, and we we would very much like to see both um, for-profits and not-for-profits and researchers and entrepreneurs and, and, and all sorts of different organizations coming together as part of an innovation team to compete in this challenge. Um, and indeed, we think that having uh, all of those kind of folks on board with different uh, expertise will be alt it will be important to prevail uh, in this initiative. Another point: we don't require any kind of in-kind contribution or cash contributions, uh, but I would say that if, particularly when we have for-profit collaborators involved, I would I would I would um, submit that um, if they were to make an in-kind or cash contribution to the project, which would sit alongside Weston Family Foundation funding, I think that may be deemed to increase the competitiveness of your application uh, in the adjudication process. So all that to say, we do like to see that where it makes sense. Moving, uh, getting toward the end of my presentation, and, and, and again, I'm looking forward to uh, getting into a question and answer session with you. So if you haven't already popped a question into the dialogue, please go ahead and do that or vote up any questions that have already been entered uh, so we can address those promptly. But I did want to give you a few tips um, that we've come up with around the preparation of Shepherd phase applications. And this is based largely on some of the discussions we've had during our uh, during our cross-country road show over the last few months and, 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 and a lot of the topics that have come up in conversation. The first point I'll make is we are seeking transformative solutions and we do not fear risk. Uh, we, have, we don't require preliminary data. Uh, we do not require a long and storied history in horticultural innovation. Um, we are looking for great ideas. We're looking for out of the box thinking. We're looking for crazy ideas. Um, and in, in many ways, we think that that is how we're going to address this challenge statement with ideas that are truly um, a, a, a quantum leap forward and not just incrementally building on uh, technologies and concepts that already exist. Number two, I want to stress the importance of energy solutions, uh, both in terms of of environmental sustainability, but also in terms of commercial sustainability. It is very important for us uh, that the food product that is derived from your system is can achieve price parity with competitors, most particularly foreign competitors. And it's our view that in particular, when we're talking about controlled environment agriculture solutions, uh, energy, of course, is one of the major line items in any cost of goods sold statement. We want to make sure that you address that. That will be so important 
we, we encourage you to think creatively um, about alternative energy solutions. We encourage you to think a lot about and deeply about energy storage and how that can be achieved, how you can benefit from, uh, from natural sources of energy and, and more synthetic sources. Um, so please don't overlook this. This will be really important, we think, to ultimately prevailing in this challenge. I think I mentioned earlier that we don't require uh, that you demonstrate or implement your, uh, your innovation um, commercially before the end of the challenge. If you choose to do that, that is your business. Um, we certainly don't prevent or restrict that. Um, but we do, what we're looking for is that your solution will be ready to hit the market by the end of the challenge, therefore around 2028. And that's really what the scaling phase funding is meant to support, that you can show that this is ready for prime time and can produce berries uh, in the context of a mass market. And my last tip is um, please do think deeply about what other crops your solution will be transferable to. I haven't, in the previous webinars, I've talked a lot more about why we selected berries, um, but I think the key reason is because we thought that berries were an excellent demonstration crop and that if you could develop a solution for berries that otherwise that meets all of the criteria in our challenge statement we think that solution solution will be transferable to myriad other crops um, so please think about what it'll be transferable to the judges are going to be looking at this very carefully it's a very important consideration but again you don't need to demonstrate that transferability we need you to represent what you think the transferability is conceptually, but we don't need you to actually demonstrate it. We do need, of course, you to demonstrate it for berries. So I'm gonna stop there, uh, Lucas, um, and um, I'm hoping, I I'm not able to see whether there are any questions and questions that have come up. I hope there have. Again, if you haven't put questions in uh, to the dialogue box, please go ahead and do that. And uh, um, uh, I'm happy to jump in. I was going to invite my colleague, uh, who's the director of communications here at the Weston Fam Family Foundation, uh, Laura Arlebaugh Stewart, uh, to come in now, and, and hopefully she's been monitoring this. And uh, and Lucas and I will do our best to be on the receiving end and try to address some of these questions. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, so I have looked at these. Thank you all for adding these and for voting. I will say just off the bat, um, many of these can be found on um, the Homegrown Innovation uh, website. Under the uh, Apply section, there's a big long list of FAQs. So if anybody misses this information now, um, please go check there as well. Um, and some of these have also already been answered uh, by Jeff, but I think it doesn't, uh, there's nothing harmful to go through them again. As a comms person, I know that redundancy is um, key to making sure people get all of the information they need. So uh, first one is really back to something you've already addressed, Jeff. Um, for the Shepherd application, can a startup company be the principal investigator or is that role only for universities and colleges? How about the next phase? Right, the Shepherd phase and the scaling phase are the same and that is and, and have the same requirement and that is it must be a qualified donee who plays that role. So a qualified donee, again, it could be a university, could be a college, could be a government entity, um, could be a registered charity, uh, but it cannot be uh, a for-profit entity. We encourage the participation of for-profit entities, specifically farmers, producers, um, as collaborators. And as I noted, qualified donees are entitled to transfer funds to those uh, entities as they procure goods and services at uh, fair market rates. But the lead really needs to be the qualified donee, and indeed that is the entity that receives uh, the funding directly from the Homegrown Innovation, oh, excuse me, from the Weston Family Foundation. Great, thank you. Um, is the challenge focused on developing new technology for berry growth, or can we conduct experiments to improve and establish berries of interest? For example, determine ideal growth conditions. Maybe you'd like to address that, Lucas. Um, I'll toss yeah. that to you. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks very much for that one. I think for this question, we would refer you back to the challenge statement, which is really about um, you know technologies that can extend the growing season of berries. So within that, 
you know, any route that can justifiably push on that goal is in scope. So whether, uh, I mean, if it's robotics or lighting, genetics, et cetera, if you can justify how, um, you know, determining ideal growth conditions would help us get around some of those barriers that prevent us from growing berries year round now, um, then that could be in scope. But also I'd urge you to consider too, the, those other dimensions about, is this something that can be market ready? How would this scale up? Uh, and kind of what that technology, what that IP looks like. Great. Um, a more logistical question, will the webinar be recorded and made available? Yes, it will be. We are currently recording and we'll make it available on our site uh, shortly after the, uh, the event. And I might just add, I, I believe we recorded our first two webinars as well, and I believe those are also still available on our website. And we did provide a little bit of a different um, uh, presentation for those two webinars. So if you're really looking for information, um, you can also try to find those uh, recordings of the, uh, the webinars we conducted um, uh, earlier this year. Great. Um, just a nice comment here that says thank you. So you're most welcome. <laughs> Um, another one, just wanted to confirm uh, a t that a team doesn't need to have received funding from the Spark phase to apply to the Shepherd phase. That's a good one. Yeah, that's something I should have mentioned in my presentations. Who, whoever asked that question, I thank you for it. Um, indeed, no, the Spark funding is not required to enter the, enter the Shepherd phase. And I would say that Spark grantees have no leg up on those who do not hold sh uh, Spark funding going into the shepherd phase. Um, part of the, um, the purpose of Spark funding was really to support teams to prepare their applications for the shepherd phase. So, um, uh, so absolutely, it's not a consideration. And in, in addition, if you applied for Spark funding and were not successful, still you're still absolutely welcome and encouraged to apply to the shepherd phase. And um, I, I recently uh, engaged with uh, a group that was unsuccessful at the Spark phase, and they rethought things and taken the judges' feedback to heart. And uh, happy to have that conversation. If that's you and you applied and you were rejected, we're quite happy to have a conversation and talk to you about how you might strengthen your application uh, for the Shepherd phase. Um, all right. Uh, oh, sorry. Another one came in, and I lost my spot. Sorry. Um, you stress energy solutions as key to reducing production cost and to beat current market prices. Should we include energy monitoring in our application? Oh, I can address that and then maybe uh, toss it over to Lucas. Um, we don't require a lot of um, detail in the application. Um, I would say maybe what's more important um, is we do ask for you to kind of articulate what your projected cost structure will be and give us some sense of what those reduced costs of goods sold would be and why you think you're able to achieve that. Uh, so we do require some detail on that. Uh, just in terms of the energy monitoring itself, I, I think there, yeah, I think that can be addressed in the application, Lucas. We don't specifically ask for it, is that right? Yeah, you'll see that the application does ask for details on your tech, the technical aspects of your proposal. Uh, it's somewhat open ended, so you could include that if that is kind of a differentiating or unique aspect of your solution uh, that we would want to know more about. You can definitely include that in there, in, the, in there as well. In terms of monitoring as well, I'm wondering if you're also referring to environmental footprint monitoring as energy is uh, kind of uh, a function of you know, greenhouse gas emissions and the like. Uh, we have a section in the application as well in there that would ask you to define the, the sort of benefits and drawbacks of your solution in regards to various environmental footprints. So it might be something that you uh, speak about as well uh, in that portion. All right, next. Um, when you say that berries would be made available to Canadians at a competitive price, does that mean through a wholesale slash retail intermediary primarily? Well, we don't dictate that at all. Um, so, you know, how you choose to distribute your berries is really up to you. What we, what we ultimately are trying to achieve is to reduce our trade deficit 
around fruits and vegetables and indeed around berries. So we want this to be done to be widespread. We want a lot of Canadians really from coast to coast to be able to access berries that are produced using your system. Uh, but how you choose to penetrate the market is really um, at your discretion. Um, some universities have incubators with startup companies that would be important in setting up growing facilities. How can we deal with this potential conflict of interest? Well, I don't know that it's a conflict of interest. Um, we very much encourage the participation of startups um, and entrepreneurs. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, as long as our funding is directed to the qualified donee, uh, I don't see how that could be a problem, even if that startup is based within the walls of the qualified donee. Um, I presume it'd be a separate corporate entity with a separate bank account. So uh, whoever that asked that question maybe didn't interpret your question properly. So maybe pop some a little, a little bit more detail so we can provide a better answer than that. All right. Uh, can a for-profit collaborator be part of more than one application? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The only restriction we have on participation is that the lead, the principal investigator um, identified in the application can only be the principal investigator on a single application. So collaborators can collaborate on as many applications as they like. Co-applicants can be a co-applicants as many applications as they like. And to be sure, a qualified donee can submit as many applications and hold as many grants. As, as they like. Uh, we don't restrict that. The only thing is really around that key person who is leading the initiative. Um, and we require that that person only be uh, the lead on one uh, application. Um, so and we very much, particularly in the form of qualified donees, we very much encourage qualified donees, uh, particularly larger institutions to submit multiple applications. But please do remember that each application needs to encompass a complete solution. Um, so you won't be competitive if you do not have a solution from soup to nuts that addresses our challenge statement. So I'd encourage you, uh, some of the conversations I've had with some folks recently is, you know, uh, around potentially dividing their team in half and having two separate applications. And that could make sense. But as long as each, as I said, each application uh, encompasses a complete solution to the challenge statement. All right, so we're actually running just slightly behind. I know that there are some other questions, but I would um, encourage those folks to find Lucas and Jeff or they can find you um, throughout the course of this networking event and um, we will move to the next section. Can I just add, I just saw Charles just clarified his question about the, um, the conflict of interest. Um, so I'm just looking at that now and I don't, yep. I don't see any issue if the PI is also involved with the startup. I don't see that as a problem at all. So hopefully that fully addresses your your um, your concerns, Charles. Great. Thanks uh, very much, everyone, for those very uh, valuable and interesting questions. Um, and again, we'll be around in the last portion of the agenda to answer any further questions you might have. Uh, just look for us at the Weston Family Foundation table in the floor view. So now we're gonna to transition to the structured networking part of the agenda. Uh, and I'll just give a bit of an overview of how that's gonna work. Um, so going, so again, going back, you'll see that you're grouped in tables of about seven or eight. Uh, so overall, what we're gonna be doing is focusing networking at each table. Um, and we're, there's gonna be six rounds uh, where we shuffle tables and participants get mixed around uh, to meet different people. Um, and each of these sessions will be 15 minutes. So overall, what we're hoping is that everyone uh, at each networking session at each table has a chance to present a little bit about themselves, uh, their work, their idea, um, and you know how that relates to the homegrown innovation challenge. Uh, and that you know through this, over the course of the day, uh, everyone meets a lot of different and interesting and relevant uh, connections that you could potentially fold into your team, uh, into your solution. Uh, an application into the homegrown uh, innovation challenge. So when we shuffle you, when you get into your new table uh, and arrive there, 
uh, I would ask that everyone around the table spends one minute, just up to one minute, introducing themselves, talking a little bit about what they do, what they're interested in is in the challenge. And then when everyone's finished, use the remainder of, this, the, of that 50 minute session. So that should be another kind of five to seven minutes uh, to then talk across the group and ask any questions and, and start discussing about any ideas you might have. Uh, in some cases, there might be a staff member from the foundation at your table. Um, we might be ducking in and out, uh, contributing here and there, but otherwise these will be unmoderated tables. So feel free to kind of moderate it and, uh, and kind of push that flow of discussion yourselves. At each shuffle, when you do land at a table, can we ask that you just leave about 30 seconds of a gap just to let everyone settle in? We might be making some last minute moves between tables as well. Um, so just give everyone a little chance to check their mic and their camera, et cetera, and for us to make some of those moves uh, before starting uh, the round of, of discussions. As you know as well, we are trying to accommodate this event in both English and French. And we have some participants that may be using uh, translation support during the networking section during the table shuffles. So if you are going to be at a table with a translator, uh, we've asked the translators to introduce themselves so you'll know that this is a table that's going to be speaking both French and English. Uh, and if so, uh, when you do speak, say you've used your one minute to introduce yourself and talk about your work, if you could please leave a small gap afterwards so that the translator can then uh, come in and summarize for others at the table before the next person proceeds and, and, uh, uh, and begins speaking. Uh, and again, if you find uh, an interesting idea or partner throughout these networking sessions, don't forget to leave your contact details in your table chat so people can find you. Uh, and of course, you could also direct message them. Um, and again, we'll be leaving an open session about 40 minutes at the end of this meeting, at the end of this event, for you to find time at one of the tables to sit down with any people that you had sparked some ideas with uh, and continue that conversation. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand it back to our colleague Jessica, who's gonna put us back in the floor view and begin the table shuffles. Thanks very